Hello, hello, everyone. Well, today, yes, I know I did say 935. And I know some of you are used to me not, you know, kind of sliding in and being a little bit late. I have to apologize. Uh, a couple of things happening, sneezing fit, which I didn't think you wanted to be a party to. And also um, on our tribe today, uh, a few situations that we had to like hold hands uh, encourage people, give virtual hugs to, and that just took a little bit of time. So thank you for your patience. Hello, I'm Terry Harden, Walt Disney's legendary Imagineer. I designed the, I'm one of the team, uh, everything's a team with Imagineering, but I designed the Dragon's Lair in Paris and Big Thunder with people and, and, uh, many other things. I did Ghostbusters, Men in Black. I'm a internationally trademarked artist and speaker, blah, blah, blah. Um, but today I wanted to talk about a really, really fun adventure that I had. And um, and uh, it was at, 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 well, let's rewind. Hi, if you're just joining us, welcome. If you're joining me live, welcome. It's Ask Me Anything Friday, woohoo, which means Post in the comments any of your questions that you might have, and I will indeed answer them, okay? Uh, don't worry. Uh, ask me just about anything that you want to ask me. Forgive me. I'm um, wanting to pull some things that I want to show you. So, uh, uh, and I did not get the chance to carry them over so that you can see them. So I am going to do that now while I'm chatting to you about if you are joining us after the broadcast, please post in the comments where you're from. Say hello. I would really, really, really love that. Uh, there, there we go. Yeah, that's good. Um, I have to be careful about what I do show publicly because I could get into a touch. I think that's good, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. There we go. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Do I have a Star Wars one up there? I'll grab that one too. Yeah, there we go. Okay. So I'm just going to get these over so that I can show you guys and share with you what has been happening and uh, super excited about it. So, as you know, um, and maybe you don't know, that I am a big Star Wars fan. Huge, giant. And I know that uh, for some of you, I'm preaching to the choir, aren't I? The reality is this. Uh, I went in 1977 to see it. I have seen it an awful, 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 awful lot. And... Uh, uh, So my friend Josie had to take a pause and think about what exactly I was going to say to you. Uh, excuse me a moment. Let me just move this. Okay, there we go. Was I not quite ready? Yeah, I was ready. It's just the Disney bag, et cetera, et cetera. So, hi, good morning. How are you? Hopefully, happy Friday. Forgive me for being a little discombobulated. I had another sneezing fit. And whenever I have those, it, it just throws me off a little bit. Um, so I'm going to grab it. I'm going to grab, I'm going to grab a hold of it and off we go. So, my friend Josie Katz invited me to the Academy Museum to see Star Wars. And I was very excited about it. I'm going to show you this picture right here. Here it is. And what you are, whoops, I don't know what I did there. There we go. Hold on. I did something crazy. I don't know what I did. Hopefully I didn't mess anything up. Anyway. Um, <laughs> ah, okay. So here's the picture that you saw in the thumbnail, if you took a look. And uh, below are two amazing gentlemen. One of them is the amazing um, John Dykstra. That's him right here. And then over here is Richard Edlund. Now, I actually got a glimpse of Richard while I was waiting to go in, but I did not recognize him because 
Uh, he has jet, he has striking white hair and no beard and no mustache. And when I knew him at the time of the filming of 2001 and at the time of the filming of, uh, Ghostbusters, uh, he, it was all different. So I didn't recognize him originally, but, uh, I did get to speak with him and John Dykstra after the event, which was very nice. I have worked for both of them. John Dykstra, I worked with while he was doing Spaceballs. No, I didn't do Spaceballs. I just got to work with them in Apogee while they did that. I was building puppets for a thing called uh, Disposer Care, a commercial. Uh, but then um, Richard, of course, was doing, 2000, uh, doing 2010, the sequel to 2001, and also Ghostbusters, and uh, I worked on, on both of those. And I got to mention to Richard that I remembered he did, you know, he may, when we did it, we were out at uh, Marina Del Rey and he always had chili cook-offs every Friday. And then I was the one that created the the big salad in half of the planets from 2010 and uh, put little marshmallow, built marshmallow men out of marshmallows and put them in the salad to represent the marshmallow man team. Meanwhile, Joe Viscosal, and Eric Fiedler were in a corner trying to set them on fire. Joe Viscoso, of course, won an Academy Award for Independence Day. Lots of people in the room. My friend Greg Nicotero, the director of Walking Dead, was there and many others. Hard to tell because the Academy insists that you wear a mask. So you come in and they've got to check your credentials, make sure you're vaccinated, make sure you're boosted, and then they make sure you wear a mask. And they let you know you do, never, you do not remove that mask at any time while inside. Uh, you can do it while eating at their wonderful uh, restaurant, but uh, you have to, the rest of the time, mm -mm, not allowed. So uh, so we sat through the entire Star Wars with masks on, okay? Before I tell you more about Star Wars, you know what's coming. I'm going to invite you guys to be a part of the Patreon page. Whoop, whoop. Terry's Tribe, that's right. Patreon.com slash Terry Harden, where your voice We'd love for you to add your voice to the mix of a, a marvelous community of people who help each other at a time when it doesn't look like human beings are in the mood to help each other. They're more destructive, aren't they? I mean, there is so much destruction going on, shootings and massacres, that it feels like people are becoming a little bit desensitized. Um, not a fan of Twitter, but on Twitter, there was a, a thread that just people were like, that doesn't count because I, I didn't even understand it. It was, it was just a lot of the stuff being said there that just didn't make any sense to me. I'm not much of a Twitter person. Cause I just think, I don't think Twitter is very cool. My opinion. I just don't, I'm not a fan. Um, I'll post a couple of things, but I want to post positive things. And then every once in a while, someone will make a comment that you just don't get. And uh, so I, I try to avoid it. But my point is on Patreon, everybody supports each other, helps each other, encourages each other. And uh, I'm often sharing a lot with people on uh, how they can make a living doing what they love, little tidbits, things like that. So uh, please check it out. $5 a month, $60 a year. And you can be part of the tribe and the private Facebook page. I encourage you to check it out. Okay, commercial is over. So this is my birthday month, guys. And um, uh, this was a really nice thing for Josie to take me to, this Star Wars. And what was really great about this Star Wars is uh, we soon learned that... Uh, I'm just gonna... Oh, I didn't put him on there. I'm sorry. Um, I was telling you about what you got to have. So here you go. Here's my wrist. And it shows that I'm a member of the Academy. And then the pink one is the one that you have to wear that shows that you've been checked by the health people and that you're wearing a mask. And here I am to prove there I am in my mask with the uh, Hayao Miyazaki coming out of the top of my head. It actually leaves uh, Sunday is the last day for you to see this exhibit which is incredible. So if you love Miyazaki and you haven't seen this exhibit, consider doing that this weekend. It's a lot of fun. Um, let's see. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, here's a close-up of Mr. Dykstra. Doesn't he look really happy, John? Um, and then here is a close-up of Richard. So they were doing their 
their talk under the beautiful Star Wars. There were other pictures, but I can't really share them here. I'll probably share them privately on Patreon because uh, I don't know about intellectual property as far as they're concerned. So I don't want to cross any lines. I want to be protective of that, which I love, which is Star Wars. But as I said, we were told it was the original print and the only existing 70 millimeter print there are no others so uh we were told that it's got a, it had to go through a special projector of course it did and that it was fragile so that it might tear turned out it did and to exercise a little uh respect because uh the people who had restored it had done the best they could but it is from 1977 and uh, what I loved about it was, as I mentioned uh, to a couple, to my husband, there was no George Lucas CG anywhere. So a few, a few years after Star Wars came out, George, the, 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 um, the, um, the world progressed enough that George could go back and use a computer to computer doctor a lot of the things that he was unable to do in 1977 because the technology didn't exist. OK, and so he started to do stuff with CG in the original film, and then he didn't make the original film accessible for you to have. So if you buy the DVD of Star Wars, it's got that junk in it and it just not my not for me. No. It's hard on me not to watch it the way I watched it 183 times as a as a young girl. And uh, I just I just was so excited to see it um in its original state and i know the movie very well i mean after you've seen it over 100 times nearly 200 times and this is just theater viewings because there was no internet there was no dvds and there were no vhs uh so you had to be in the theater to watch it um it, 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 i was so excited i could see every little detail that had upset me that wasn't there so a key one is a long shot of the dewbacks with the stormtroopers on top and they don't move. It's just like a little head tilt because that's all, it was a practical creature that someone was actually operating, you know, from inside or behind or whatever. And, um, and then later George Lucas does some CG to make them really come alive. And I didn't like it. I don't like that version. Um, I like the original version, but then I'm a purist. So what can I say? So then I got to see it. Now, my friend who took me, Josie, she, I hadn't realized that she had really not seen it on the big screen. Or if she did, it was a long time ago. And she flipped over the cantina scene. She just went crazy over the cantina scene. And she turned to me and she said, you know, no matter what Disney does in Galaxy's Edge, they're never going to get that feeling that you're feeling inside the actual Star Wars cantina. And she's absolutely right. One of the things that I thought was a challenge with the cantina in Galaxy's Edge is I wish they would have hired more scruffy, grumpier bartender people because that's one of the things I loved was that, you know, this is Moss Eisley, you know, never has there been, you know, the land of scum and villainy. And yet you've got these cute little perky cast members um, and a perky robot, which just don't, don't, they run against the grain with the cantina for me. But, uh, but it's really neat to see the original. She really enjoyed it. And I said, if you get the chance to see it again, you can see that some characters there, you're kind of like, why is that in there? Because George Lucas was on a small budget. And these men talked about that as well as I know a lot about it because it is my baby. And when you have something that you love really a lot, don't you just study it till there's no more, nothing left to study. Well, that's me in Star Wars, at least these first three films. Um and uh, uh, they talked about the fact that the budget was low, that the budget, you know, it was a low budget movie and that uh, it's kind of like what people film independence for nowadays. That's what that's what uh, uh, he said. And uh, uh, they they needed someone who could fill the cantina for uh, a good a good a good price and enter the amazing makeup artist, Rick Baker, who had all of these kind of things on his shelf. I think he told me that he had to cast up a few more of the band members, but uh, for the most part, that's what was on his shelf and people put it on. And that's why you've got like a weird vampire thing and a strange, like you look over and you go, what in the world is that doing in there? Um, and it just works. 
it works out pretty, pretty nicely, pretty well. Um, I still knew most of the lines. I knew where all the mistakes were, all the excitement. And uh, Josie was, it was great to see someone who hadn't seen it for a while be very entertained. And she said it was great to see someone get so excited to, because I actually got to see the seriously original 70 millimeter film, which is what I love. That That is that's my jam. My favorite movie is Empire Strikes Back. And they did talk a little bit about Empire Strikes Back. In fact, uh, Dijkstra said, ooh, I'm jumping into Empire Strikes Back. But he talked about the Dijkstra Flex camera and how there were just a bunch of guys. Okay. And this is what I want to encourage you guys out there. If you're wanting to do stuff, don't wait till somebody hires you. Get your people together and make something. You guys have a blessing called the internet and social media, and you've seen some of the fan films that people do. Just get together with your friends and make something and then post it and post your dream. This is what I want to do. If you're someone who writes scripts and nobody is looking at your scripts, then get together with your friends and, and cast it and shoot it and make it happen because uh, it's amazing what can come from that. Uh, understand that a step in any direction, even if it's the wrong one, creates momentum. So you guys getting together with your buddies and your friends, i.e. like George Lucas and 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 John Dykstra and Stuart Ziff and et cetera, you know, all these people, um, they came together. And just like Walt Disney, George Lucas said, what I really want is a camera that gives me those dog fights I saw as a kid that can follow the ship, that can turn with the ship, blah, blah, blah. And John Dykstra and his team of only about eight guys less than that, probably half a dozen sat there and went, Hmm, well, let's give it a go. You know, let's go for it. Let's try it. You know? And this is the same as if you guys know, uh, legendary, uh, Imagineer, Disney legend, uh, Bob Gurr, Bob Gurr talks about when Disney, when Walt wanted to open Disneyland and he wanted a Topia cars and he stood with, and he wanted a monorail and he stood with Bob and he said, Bob, I envision this, this train that rides above and takes people and is quiet and, and, you know, looks spacey and blah, blah, blah. And Bob Girl says, well, how do you think we're going to do that? And Walt Disney said, this is exact directly from Bob Gurr. Uh, I don't know. You've got this and would walk away. And Bob would be like, Oh, but then you didn't want to disappoint. So I think the same, you know, you get people who are passionate in their field, you gather all together and you create magic. Magic happens. Um, um, Dijkstra said that he just, you know, to this day is surprised that people were so excited about giving him an Academy Award for the innovation of the Dijkstra Flex camera. But that camera is amazing. One of the things they didn't talk about is those of you who see these movies today, CG is seems to be the way things are done. Um, one of the things that comes to, 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 to mind is Moon Knight, a lot of green screen, meaning that there's a lot of green behind him. And then they put in with computer CG afterwards to create his world. Well, to do that in Star Wars, to put the ships in space, they had to hand trace and isolate the ship after filming by hand, frame by frame, by frame, by frame. So you can imagine today the way you do it on computers very differently. But uh, but yeah, this is just to see the behind the scenes in films. And many people say, gosh, it must have been tough because it's really a clunky film. I don't see it that way, guys. I don't see it that way. I relive the room stretching for me and the realization that my hobby is work. Okay. When I saw Star Wars, I saw the chess sequence, Phil Tippett. Dennis Murin. And suddenly I realized the art that I had been doing was going to be my career. And I sat in the theater and wrote down every name and then visited anyone I could to see if I could get work in the film industry. That was my goal. Just went through that door. Okay. And uh, that's where I am today. If you're looking at me going, where are you, Terry? I'm, I've never heard of you. Never da, 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 da. Google me, Google Terry Harden, and then just watch. I'm on three Wikipedia pages. This didn't happen just because I happened to be in the right place at the right time. It's because 
of just walking through a door when it opened and not worrying about where it would take me in some cases. Okay. And I urge you to do the same, but this time you got social media. So when you post your art and you post your, your work, just be sure to share your dream as well. Otherwise we just like it and we don't know what else to do, but understand people are watching and you just could get a job. Okay. You could work where you want to work or create what you want to create. So don't sit there with stacks of scripts going, who's going to buy them? No, no, no. Grab one that you love. This is what George did. Now, George did have to shop it around. No internet for him to do anything. No way for him to do it himself. And I'm sure you know, if you're Star Wars people, that he went to Universal first. He went to Universal first because he had done American Graffiti and uni that's a Universal picture. So he went to Universal first and pitched Star Wars for A New Hope. And uh, they said no. And then the door slammed in his face another half a dozen, another dozen times until he met Alan Ladd Jr. who said, hmm, this sounds interesting. Okay, let's go for it. And George was like, what? You can imagine that, you know, your last one, you're already leaving. You do the pitch, you tell him, you know, I see this Wookiee, it's a big furry thing, the princess in a white dress and this guy, pow, 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 you know. And this kid who has got the force, but he doesn't know it, da, da, da. And there's Jedi and blah, blah, blah. And you have said this like a million times. It's kind of like me when I wanted to be an Imagineer. And every time I was rejected, I have enough rejection letters from that mouse to wallpaper uh, half of California, if not all of California. So you you get in the habit of going, you know, you tell your story, but, 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 and then you go, okay, thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. And you're getting up. And then Alan Ladd Jr. says, hey. Tell me more. Let's do this. What? You see? So never give up. Never surrender. Uh, you guys, uh, if I can get this, instill this to you as best I can, this is what I want to instill upon you. Just, just look at your resources around you, the creativity. If you can't do one thing, someone else out there can. I'm sure they're your friend. Get together and make it happen, okay? Because uh, that's how things like Star Wars happens. Um and it changes people's lives like mine uh, and many, many people. Favreau, you know, uh, the person who wrote Clone Wars, the people that did those things in between four, five, and six, and one, two, and three, who were trying to hang on to the, the thrill of Star Wars. There was a, a comic that went through the times that I read every week, cut out and saved. Um, it's unbelievable. Unbelievable. You don't have to work so hard, Disney, to get good stories. Just reach out to the people who write them or wrote them in that time frame. And that's why Favreau and uh, uh, Clone Wars and these things uh, work so well. So Obi-Wan, Ken Ben Kenobi, everybody, a lot of people are really loving that. But a lot of people are also very upset at some things that are happening in there and they're attacking the actor. And I wanted to address this today before I go to your, to your questions. You understand that there's many facets about filmmaking, right? The actor just doesn't show up and make up their lines. You get this, right? I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Am I? Am I? Okay. There's a script. The script has a writer. Even the writer doesn't have power. Once that script goes to the production, the writer can or cannot have power. Ray Bradbury once said, I do plays because I have more control. Television and film cuts me out, okay? They buy my script and then I have no say, all right? And he was very frustrated at the time. Now, some people have more power, like Stephen King, who wrote The Green Mile, which is one of my favorite films. If you haven't seen it, watch it. And many of you are thinking Stephen King, scary stuff, it, and Shining. But Stephen King once said that uh, he had to do what sold in order to do what his passion was. And his passion was Shawshank Redemption and Green Mile. So go check out Stephen King's passion. I never was a big fan of him as a horror writer, but I did let him know how much I loved him with those two films. Just a lot of heart. Great films. Great, great films. So script. And then you start to cast. Now, in films, casting can take years. Seriously, one year, two years. When I audition and I audition for a film, I would say I don't find out for a year or so whether, you know, sometimes it's months before I even get a call back with movies. Now, television and commercials, they're different. It can happen within a couple of days, commercials, even a couple of hours. 
Uh, but in film, they have, they have, it takes more time. So they have time to look. And that is your casting director. Your casting director is looking for your director to see in casting. So in Obi-Wan Kenobi, there are a couple of people who I don't think are doing really well as actors. I think their casting is completely off. I'm not going to tell you who, because you may have not seen it yet. And I haven't seen the last one, but these people are getting harassed on social media. And this is ridiculous. Okay. Just let me tell you how stupid this is. You don't harass the actor. The actor is someone who's learning their lines, being directed by a director. And then the, 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 the thing is in the can once they're done. Okay. In the can, meaning that you shoot all of the footage that you're going to shoot. And then the computer graphics people, CG people do their bit which is post, which is after the film, a lot of the film has been shot or sometimes simultaneously. Okay. You get it. So let's use, for example, the movie Caesar, which was about the lead uh, planet of the apes, ape, new ape. And uh, Andy Serkis was doing the character. He was mo mo-capped or performance captured, meaning he wore a lot of dots and a little balls. You've seen it, guys. Something for the CG to register, right? But he is restricted to his anatomy. Human anatomy can only go so far. You cannot overstretch your mouth. That's as far as it goes. You cannot do things weird with your eyes. I mean, some people can you cannot do weird, stretched, rubbery things with your body. You can only do what God has given you. Bones move a certain way. Flesh moves a certain way. Muscles move a certain way. You get that, right? So now you have the actor acting opposite Andy, doing his best work being Caesar, Caesar not Caesar, Caesar. And then the animators in CG animate. Well, they overanimated Caesar so much that the two actors reacting caught garbage of their acting because they didn't react to some of the things the computer guy did. So understand that computer stuff happened after. Happened after. The actors are off doing another movie. And this is happening after. So they're not really happy about, happy about it, okay? The original Stuart Little... Uh, G, uh, uh, Davis, uh, Gina Davis was really upset by the fact that when she finally saw the movie of Stuart Little, that the character was so cute because she was acting against the little ball, little balls that bounced around no face, no nothing, little green balls. And so she felt that she was at a serious disservice because she never got to see what Stuart looked like officially until the movie opened. So it's really important that you understand. And why am I telling you this with Star Wars and these fellas right here is because they point that out. That back in the day of Star Wars, they used a thing called film. If you don't know what it is, please Google it. Film meant it went through a camera. It meant that the only way you could record anything that you saw in a movie for real, was to put it in front of said camera while said film moved. If it didn't get in front of the camera, it didn't get in the film. So he felt that this gave you some serendipitous moments that you can't get with CG because all things CG have to go through a computer and sometimes overthinking, overanalyzing it. And so he was talking about the purity of it sometimes and the practicality of building the models, which the art is always incredible, guys. I mean, seriously, the art is incredible. So you just go, oh, my gosh. I mean, this stuff is built. During 2010, I actually got to see the ships from 2001 being built by model builders who would just blow you away. They were so talented. So this is what I'm talking about. And, and the actors knew that the performances they did on the camera would not be altered because what they were seeing. Now there's some things that they, that were, you know, married and things and they had to pretend to fly the ships and stuff like that, but it wasn't to the extreme that's happening now. Take us back to the latest Star Wars stuff and Obi-Wan Kenobi and stuff like that. Um, these actors are at the mercy of sometimes CG and poor casting. 
there's a couple of things that I'm watching now in Ben Kenobi that I have trouble with because the casting is really not good. Um, and that's just the casting director. So the next time you want to blast someone, look up the casting director and tell the casting director your opinion. Because the actor, a lot of the times, doesn't have that kind of say. The director's directing them. They're doing their best. They're doing their work. And then afterwards, they they have no no control. Okay, so we got to cut them a break. I really get tired of people attacking the actors when I know as an actor what it takes to do this. Okay, okay, so let's get to your questions. But if you have a statement based on what I said, you feel free to just come right out with it. Okay, um, do not insult the person personally, do not uh, insult their character. Just let's have a debate. You disagree, I disagree. I'm going to respect you. You respect me and vice versa. Okay. Let's go to your comments. All right. I, it was really important that I share that with you today because it's very sad. Okay. So before I go to the comments, let's talk about the power of the dog. All right. Power of the Dog is one of the dullest films. I don't even know why the Academy even voted for it. In other words, unless they thought they were getting kudos because that movie is just plain boring. Two hours of pain and suffering because you have two of the most boring actors acting opposite themselves. A choice that I wouldn't have made, but I'm not casting, okay? They both could be really good actors in another role, but I didn't like them in Power of the Dog. And they're married. I think they're two of the dullest actors in so many things. They're very limited in their acting. They, they're, they're, they, you know, you, they don't seem to be asked to stretch at all. And then it just gets more and more. The more you go into it, it, that movie just gets more and more boring for me. It was two hours of torture. And as my husband says, I could have been doing laundry. That's what I feel about that film. I am so grateful that it didn't win for best picture. Um, I would have really doubted my Academy of Motion Pictures, but they are strong uh, filmmakers and um, people in the film industry and you cannot sway them too much. So if they really believe in something, they're going to go for it. And they sided with me in, in, in CODA. And I absolutely went crazy for this movie. Thought it was brilliant. Thought it didn't hit me over the head. Helped me to see something I didn't really see because I'm not... Um, I am not a deaf person, and sometimes I don't think about some of the challenges that someone with this situation might might uh, uh, have to deal with, like a uh, hearing child. Um, I just thought this was great. I thought this was a beautifully told, well-directed, brilliantly acted film. So um, kudos to everybody, direction, um, script writing, um, camaraderie, teamwork, a beautiful film, and I'm glad the Academy saw it. But that's what I'm talking about, okay? The actors got together and decided they wanted this movie to be a real big deal, but the directors and the producers are the ones that are going to, you know, get it in the can and get it to us, right? Okay, so let's go to what you have to say now. Hello, Evan! Happy Friday, everyone. I hope you all had a great Memorial Day weekend, and I agree with Joe. I hope you had a great Memorial Day weekend. The week went fast, didn't it? Man, whoosh for me. So fast. I was like, wow, it's already Friday. Um, you saw how late, well, maybe you didn't, how late I posted the, the thumbnails for this because I was thinking it was a different day. Yeah, go figure. Um, good morning. Two questions. How was your Memorial Day and did you have a chance to watch Obi-Wan? I watched the first two episodes of Obi-Wan. Uh, I know the third has dropped, but I watch it with my husband. Um, he's not so sure he wants to watch it anymore. Okay, so Michael, let me tell you something about those who have seen the original three Star Wars films. You have a um, you have a melting pot of people with different opinions and different feelings. And um, one of the things that my husband really love about Obi Wan, I can think I can say this for him, is that they're taking it into another Star Wars universe. We're actually not trying to CG. Uh, Carrie Fisher, or Mark Hamill's face on people, which drives me insane. I don't like it. It's time for Mark Hamill, Carrie Fisher, um, um, you know, everybody to have a rest. Stop. Stop. We love them in the films that they're in. Time to move on. So it was great to see you and McGregor again for me. Um, my husband's not so sure. We did not love the first three films, The Phantom Menace and all of that garbage. 
Um, I won't get into that. If you ask me a question, you can, and you want to know about it, but I'm just going to tell you, I didn't like any of them. And uh, that's because I felt like those films were treat treating me like an idiot. So those of us who saw the first three, uh, four, five, and six, uh, we, I, for one, had all 12 treatments of George Lucas's books and the sagas. Yeah, I had that. Had a huge collection, which I sold in 2007 for a lot of, lot of cash. But uh, I had those, okay? And I didn't understand why George chose to not do the three that he had done in the treatments because I thought they were more interesting. But let's say you didn't know that. My problem was I didn't like being made to feel that certain more powerful characters, i.e. Darth Maul, uh, dies because Obi-Wan is in the sequel. You don't want to be made to, you want Obi-Wan to win because Obi-Wan's the best, right? And I felt like Darth Maul was a better fighter and he had to die because Obi-Wan was in the sequel already that was shot. So that kind of stuff was was hard for me in the first three films. Not a fan of those at all. And, uh, and so... Um, and so, but I did, I do like the idea of following young Obi-Wan. I do. And I'm excited to see where it goes. And I pray that they don't try and stretch a two hour movie over eight hours like uh, Boba Fett did. Ugh. Just don't get me started with Boba Fett. I just thought to myself, there it, it really had potential by the second episode, but then it was so dull. Who wants to watch a man in a tank for, for several episodes, you know? I just thought it was, you know, don't try to stretch two hours over eight. Take the time to write eight hours of a a show, okay? Mandalorian did it. So So follow it, study. You know, that's the problem with a lot of these things that go up. You wonder if they looked at anything else that was successful over several episodes or did they just think they just were going to know it? You know, there's nothing wrong in studying, you know, and there's nothing wrong in researching how to do long, drawn out episodics. OK, if you're used to doing the two hour movie three hour movie, but now you got to do eight hours of content, roughly, then look at things that do that. I highly recommend Downton Abbey. I know you're like, what? Downton Abbey did six seasons and now two movies that are excellent. Excellent. Written by the same fellow, Julian Fellows. Check it out and watch it and then watch it again and dissect it. It is incredible how they've been able to, over the years, six seasons with not just six episodes, guys, more like 10 or 12 and they keep it fresh every single time. And this new era movie is incredible. My husband says he felt it was a little rushed. That's a story for a different time. But the point is, I loved it. I thought it was amazing. And it did not disappoint. And when you think about it, that's not easy to do. We've seen it in things like Boba Fett and Moon Knight. I was so flipping done. So bored, you know, excited when I went in, not so excited when I exited. So, so I've got a lot of hopes for Ben Kenobi. It, it, the last two, you know, kept me, kept me vested. My husband has a different opinion. I won't state it here now, but we're still willing to give it a couple of more shows. I want to watch it to the start to the finish. Um, but he may not because he, there's certain things that he looks for that he says he's not seen. So there you go. It's not going to be for everybody. Of course not. But this is the closest since Mandalorian that I've seen. And I'm very excited. I hope this is the direction that they're, they're planning to go. My caution to Favreau is don't let Disney put their fingers in it too much. Trust your instincts, Luke. And uh, you're the one who made this really Mandalorian happen along with the writer from Clone Wars, you know, you two keep your heads together and kind of keep Disney a little bit at bay because we've seen what they've done with the Star Wars films and it's not pretty, okay? It's not pretty. In fact, I was hearing the other day that the girl who plays Rey is catching a lot of flack for her character and it's not her fault. I'm not a fan of that character either, but I'm not going to go diss the actress for it. It's not her fault, okay? You understand? She is someone who is doing a job and she's doing it to the best of her ability and she's cute and she's adorable. There are just choices that they made that they asked her to do to the script that I disagree with and makes her dull to me. That's all. Yeah, I'd rather watch Luke. 
who does a great clueless face. Seeing him in Star Wars do that great clueless face, I'll never forget it. Mark Hamill as Luke Skywalker um, in uh, in Star Wars is just just joyful to watch. And the the uh, mercenary behavior of uh, of uh, Harrison Ford as Han Solo is always special. And for those of you who argue about Gui about Greedo and Han Solo, Han Solo of course shot first. Han Solo is a mercenary. Han Solo is a smuggler. Han Solo is, get this, guys, the bad guy, okay? Not the good guy when he starts out. He's the bad guy. Now, he might be the neutral guy, but he's definitely not the good guy, okay? So he did shoot first. Of course he shot first. So uh, don't have that battle. Um it's, 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 you know, Greedo was, was ready to cause some problems and Solo took him out. So there you go. Okay. Um, there you go. Uh, Memorial Day was amazing. Uh, I uh, called my dad and uh, thanked him for his service. He was Korean War Army. And then um, I also uh, just spent some time resting with my husband and my dog. We uh, watched, uh, honestly, curled up, uh, celebrated a few Memorial Day things, and then we curled up and uh, watched Greer Garson movies. She's one of my favorite. So we curled up with some popcorn, and uh, I made a little nosh, a nice little brunch, and we watched Greer Garson films because I just kind of felt like seeing Greer in some movies like Madame Curie and uh, um, Valley of Decision. It's my favorite, one of my favorite ones that she does. Yeah, she's she's just she's just a brilliant actress. She was box office poison for a while, but she's she's really good, and I love black and white films. So that's what I did. Thank you, Michael, for asking. Bob Berdeen says, "Good morning, Terry. Good morning, Bob Berdeen. You're only allowed one rewind per broadcast. Yes, <laughs> it's true, right? <laughs> Thanks for being so patient with that." And she says, "Hi, Terry and friends. Hope everyone has had a great week." What are my weekend plans? Well, Monster Palooza is in town. Did you guys know this? Monster Palooza in Pasadena, California. If you happen to be in Southern California, this is a great, great uh, uh, convention. It has a lot of industry people in there, lots of sculptors and people. I actually got to meet uh, Rico Browning, who was the underwater swimmer for Creature from the Black Lagoon, the one with Julie Adams, and also got to meet Julie. So you get to meet some really cool people there. Tippy Hedrum is there one time too. Lots of cool stuff happens at Monster Palooza. And my friend, uh, Paul Devers, is uh, going to be doing his podcast, which is... Uh, he, he is a pumpkin sculptor, and he was one of the contestants that I judged on Outrageous Pumpkins, and he he did win. And uh, he does this Carvers and Creators podcast that's really great, the show, where they carve while they're chatting. They So they chat and they carve, and they chat and they carve. It's two or three of them. They're really nice. And they offer, introduced me to carve. I've been on their show a couple of times. They do uh, butternut squash when they can't find a pumpkin. And uh, so they're going to be there. They're going to be doing demos. They're going to be interviewing. They're going to show past shows. Uh, so go by and say hi to Paul and tell him you know me. You're part of the tribe. Uh, if you decide to go, uh, also look around and see. There's a lot of times people do material. It is the first place that I was introduced to uh, Monster Clay and actually met the creator of Monster Clay. So a lot of times you're going to meet some people who have created something cool and then they're they're showing it to you. So I haven't been in a long time. So I'm going to try and go tomorrow for a couple of hours and, and, and go see Paul. And uh, I hope you'll join me. It's just look it up, Monster Palooza. And uh, it goes Saturday and Sunday. And tonight it goes from 6 to 10, Paul was telling me. So it opens tonight from 6 to 10 p.m. And then tomorrow it opens at like 9 or 10 and goes till 6 or something like that. Anyway, sounds really cool. Yeah. So I'm thinking of popping in and, and, and saying hello. Very excited. Very excited. So that's something I'm going to do this weekend. Yes, for sure. And then catch up on some work, obviously. Keep sculpting. Uh, uh, just keep sculpting. <laughs> like, just keep swimming. But thank you for asking, Angie. No popcorn in the theater. Same at the Dolby Company Theater and the theater at the Walt Disney Family Theater. Oh, my goodness. Yes. Can you imagine popcorn is at a high commodity? So what that means is you're going to have to buy yourself some popcorn, pop it, and take it in for you if you're one of those people like me who has to have popcorn at the movies. Yeah, your popcorn's going to be better, too. You know it is. You know it is. Come on, guys. Come on. You know it is. So, yeah. Yeah. But that's okay. You know. 
I saw uh, uh, over the Memorial Day weekend because everybody was going to see Maverick. I knew the theaters would be empty. And I have, as you know, I've said it before, my husband is high risk. So we don't go to the theater when there's a lot of people inside it. So we went and saw Downton Abbey and uh, there were, count them, four people in the theater. Two of them were us. So it was amazing. <laughs> it was brilliant. Uh, a private screening without having to pay $500. Whoop, whoop. Uh, it was fantastic. And then we went to see everything everywhere with uh, Michelle, with, with Michelle Yeoh. And uh, uh, I love her, but didn't care for the movie. Just wasn't my cup of tea. Uh, many people out there just loved it and encouraged me to see it. My husband had heard a lot about it. Uh, and I yeah, it didn't do it for me. I, I wanted to, I came home and had a good dose of Miyazaki after that because I really didn't care for the film. But for those of you who liked it, yay for you. Um, um, and uh, one of my team, uh, one of my tribe people wants to have a conversation with it because she, she really liked it. And she could not understand that I didn't like it, but uh, not everybody can love everything, right? So uh, it's not, you know, it's not to hurt anybody's feelings. It just, I sat through two hours and said, yeah, I would have rather missed that one. Yep. Uh, both in San Francisco, says Leo. Yay, good. Then I might be able to get up there and do this next weekend. I'm going to try. I understand it was a uh, 1985 millimeter print. Nope, wrong. Eh, thanks for playing, Joe. But if you weren't there, eh, again, eh, 1977, 70 millimeter, the only the only one in existence, the only one. And they said they had restored it gingerly and carefully and with great love and that it could tear. And so we were all told that to exercise patience, if it did, and it did, actually it happened um, uh, just as they were following the TIE fighter and wondering why the TIE fighter is out all by itself and then the Death Star is revealed. Uh, it tore in that area, so we got to take a five-minute break. But it was, yeah, a 1977 print. Because 1985, it would have been the CG one, Joe. It would have been the CG one that George uh, George cleaned up because George wanted to. And, and we understand, okay? Let me just point out, Joe, that we understand an artist wants to improve on their work once technology has come through, but never get rid of your original piece. You can improve and make that, you know, version two or volume two or whatever, second edition. But don't get rid of the original. Case in point, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, where Steven Spielberg did something very similar, but he kept the original film intact. Later, he created a laser disc set where you could insert the scenes as you saw fit. Remember, he did Close Encounters, the special edition, but he did Close Encounters, the special edition, where a few things occurred that he thought he'd like and that fans would like, but he never erased the original film. So that is what I highly urge you to do if you're going to do things like this. Always preserve and care for your original. It's a very special piece, your original, your body, your language, your attitude, all different, okay? And then when you go back in and you start to cover up, that's what you did originally, may make you feel better, but doesn't necessarily make us feel better, and I didn't. So the 1985 one has that doctors in there, Joe. This was not in there, none of it. None of his changes were in there from the, and 1985 they are. Yeah, because I have that version. And uh, yeah, it's not my favorite, but I can't. I don't, I think my laser disc has the original, but I'm not sure. The only original I had originally is if you've got the VHS tape of Star Wars, that one most likely has the original without the CG stuff in there. Yeah, the um, VHS tape. Yep, 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 yep. Bummer that the film broke. No, no, see, this is the cool thing. You know, 1977, over my shoulder is my mermaid tail, built in 1980, guys. 1980. Do the math on that one, okay? She's an old girl back here. She was supposed to die after 10 years. So the fact that that film still exists, whoop, whoop. And you guys know Adam Savage? My husband showed me Adam Savage as he looked. He went to the prop house and saw the last remaining X-Wing fighter from 1977. Google that on YouTube, guys. You're going to be blown away. They talk about how exciting it is that it is the original 
uh, model from there. There's not a lot left. And uh, to get something from 1977 that is still intact, that you know, Adam is just gushing over it, and you will too. So, um, so yeah, just don't. If you're gonna make changes, keep the original intact, is what my husband always says, and I have to agree. Stuart Ziff, there's a name I've not heard in a long time. A long time, yeah. Stuart is responsible for casting me as the terror dog in uh, Ghostbusters. He saw my portfolio. Um, he saw a certain person in the portfolio and asked me to say something about that person. And I said, if you can't say something nice. And he said, good. And uh, he walked me out to the food truck and said, you're hired. And uh, I became the terror dog for Ghostbusters. And then I also got to work on the Marshmallow Man, as many of you know, building the Marshmallow Man uh, down in um, Marina Del Rey. So, uh, yeah, Stuart Ziff, Ziff is quite a guy. I wonder if I have my, let me just see if I have my Ghostbusters picture, because you would like this, Joe, if I can find it. I don't know. Yes, I have it. Yay. Okay. Okay, I'm going to show it to you now. I'm going to show it to you right now. I'm going to hide your comment because you're going to want to see this. But there you go. Okay, so let me show you what you're looking at. Um Stuart, 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 Stuart. I was trying to find Stuart, but I think Stuart might be in the front. So we've got me here with my hair next to the Marshmallow Man. Then next to me, you see my striped shirt. The person in front of the striped shirt is, is Randy Cook, the one who did the original animation for the, the um, Ghostbusters and the technology wasn't perfect. But then later on, he went on to do a lot more because he moved over to New Zealand and did his thing there. Behind me is the amazing Steve Johnson. You know him for a plethora of films that he and his shop worked on. If we move over here, he is the sculptor of the uh, Mr. Um, the, the, the Green Ghost, Slimer. So that's why his arm is on top of Slimer. Next to him is Mark, and Mark also a sculptor and creator there. Lots of people. Okay, and Randy, you see, he's riding on the terror dog because he was one of the sculptors of the terror dog there. And then next to him is um, Steve Neal, who's in a brilliant... Uh, brilliant Brennan Molly maker and still to this day makes models and has a great channel. So you might want to look him up. He's, he's very cool. And then Lance Anderson, who is responsible for, um, um, we did Captain EO together. And then I, Stuart, I think is, I, it got cut off in this picture, which makes me sad. I'm going to have to get a better picture so that you can see everybody. But, um, but yeah, this is the Ghostbusters shot. And here I am with my characters here. And there I am a little closer. Did the library ghost, all that kind of stuff. So um, I was hoping I had a picture of Stuart. I'm going to have to fix that because poor Stuart should get his day in the, in the, um, in the limelight. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that's where I met Richard. I should have done the chili cook off. I know I have a picture somewhere of the little marshmallows I did and the bowl and everything. And if I can find it, I'll show it to you um, another time. Okay. So yeah, Stuart Ziff, a great guy. Did you ever meet Peter Curran back then? He was in LA, LA area. Then he was with Charlie and Gary at the footprint ceremony at Chinese that August. Yes, I'm sure I know them. I'm better with faces. So, um, and like I said, that was the problem at this Academy thing because I, you shave. I'm like, who is that? You know, I did get to see, uh, when I saw John, I knew John Dykstra. When I got to tell John that, that uh, I had worked with him, he was just like a little kid and the personality was definitely there. I don't know if you recognize me because my hair was out here and down like a lion's mane, um, when I worked for them. And now you see, it's a lot more tamed, if you will. Good morning, one and all. Have a great weekend. We'll be seeing some of you tomorrow at Walt's Barn for the Gunny event. Ah, Michael, lovely. I didn't realize. But wait a minute. It's not the third Sunday. So you got something happening Saturday? Tell me more, Michael. Tell me more. I did not know of this, you say. <laughs> um, yes, 
uh, Moses has been attacked by racist jerks who claim to be Star Wars fans. Lucasfilm and Ewan McGregor both have spoken out against it and have given her their support. Yeah, I, I, uh, honestly, uh, the lead actress to me is not that good. Okay. Um, I don't think casting was good on that, but it's not her fault. It's the casting director's fault. I don't think she fits. I've seen several other people that I think would have done a better job, but uh, I'm not going to sit and attack her for that. She did her best. I just think um, delivery and, and, and body language and all of that is just a bit, it, it, it's disjointed. So it doesn't feel like it fits in the world that everyone else has created. It pulls you out of it because the acting is off. And um, it would have been nice to help her with that. Uh, but I'm not, I'm not going to attack her with that because she did what they asked her to do. And they thought they had casted well. I think they should have cast her in a different way. My opinion, of course. No reason to attack the, no reason to attack the people personally, though. No, no excuse for that. Unfortunately, some fans have attacked Lucasfilm for not doing the same for uh, Gina Carino after she had come out with right wing statements. Yeah. Uh, well, here's the thing, Joe. Gina, the day Gina was pulled from Mandalorian was a sad day for me because that woman was kick butt. She was so strong in that role. She was the reason I was watching Mandalorian, to be honest. I loved seeing her on the screen. She just ate it up for supper. And she was so, so good. She was so, so good that when she made her statements, I was heartbroken. Because the problem about celebrities and actors is sometimes they open their mouth before the brain kicks in. We're all at fault for that, but don't put it on social media. Read your emails three or four times before you send them. Read your tweets three or four times before you post them, please. And when you're live, be careful what you say, because it's not that you have to watch out for your opinions, but no once your opinions are out there, your opinions are out there. And it could make some people in power upset. Now, do you have the right to say what you want to say? Free speech. We may not agree. But unfortunately, there are people that will say, look, you said uh, you, you, your, your statements, uh, X, Y, Z people, uh, not good for the brand. I mean, take a look at this Johnny Depp situation. I don't know that people are going to run to hire Johnny Depp because being attached to him right now might not be good for their brand. And they have to protect their brand. You understand, right? It's not. I don't think it's always about not liking what you say, although that could be the case, right? Because some really radical things, really rough things are said. But um, the person will say, I'm not sure I want to attach to that because it's not good for my brand. You know, my brand doesn't want to be hand in glove with this person because my beliefs don't co don't coincide with theirs. Um, so I really miss her. I miss her. But uh, they made us. They they took a position. It's their right to do it, and uh, and uh, I think that uh, um, she's a strong enough actress, and she has her beliefs, and she felt she should say them. And she, you know, I didn't see her apologize afterwards. I didn't. Did she? Did she say, "Whoops, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say it the way I said it," or did she just stick to her guns? And if she did, then you know, there's more. There's more out there for her. She's a really good actress. Um, we may not agree with some of the things that she stated, but my God, she, you cannot argue with how good that woman is as an actress. She's unbelievably good. Um, some fans you will never please. That's true, Joe. Some fans you will never please. But uh, this fan you can, you know, just realize it's a Star Wars universe. Okay. It's not about Carrie Fisher. It's not about Harrison Ford. It's not about Mark Hamill. Okay. It's about the Star Wars universe universe. So let's go off in other directions and follow different stories like they did in Clone Wars. And uh, we're going to love it because we loved Clone Wars, right? 
I mean, look at the char the characters. What is it, Asuka? That they're going to forgive me if I said that name wrong. But they're following her, which is very exciting. I hope they do a good job. They went off and followed Boba Fett, even though I didn't like it. They went off and followed Boba Fett. Thank you. But now they're following Obi-Wan. Thank you. It's really, really great to see them take threads and follow certain threads that have led in or have created the tapestry of the original Star Wars films. Because when you do that, it means that even though in the first three films they killed Darth Maul, they can bring him back. Now, they may not be able to bring the original actor back because that's a lot of physicality, but they may be able to bring Darth Maul back and we may be able to follow the Darth Maul story, which I would like. Not really a fan of his makeup, glued on horns and face paint. I think they could do better than that. But uh, but uh, the character was very strong, very interesting, and very fun to watch. He was my favorite part of films I don't like. Um, but you could go back and follow his story. How did he get where he was, you know? And you could ask, actually bring it up to speed. Maybe he could be, instead of face paint, which maybe that's the what they thought was available, he could have the tattoos, kind of like the fella in um, Guardians of the Galaxy, where he's got his skin, you know, stuff on his skin. Um, it could be a tattoo and um, look a lot more tribal or more... Uh, cultural. Okay. Um, one of the stories that I've been watching on Disney plus is the world according to Jeff Goldberg. And I absolutely love it. And his tattoo one is really, really cool when he goes to Hawaii and asks about the Hawaiian tattoos and it's cultural based and it's really cool. So they could pull from that and follow the Darth Maul story. That's what I want as a star Wars person. I'm I'm, I love the original characters, but I want to see what else is out there. Follow other threads, follow other characters. Let us know about other characters. Okay. And they really screwed up the Darth Vader story in the first three. Um, just made a mess of it. You know, that whole thing is a big mess. It's so wrong. It isn't funny. So I have a real hard time with that. And, um, but people who grew up with those movies, you know, the room stretched for them in certain ways because they hadn't seen them. They were little kids when they saw them and they loved those films. And I don't fault you for that. It's just that for me, those films are terrible. They're completely wrong. So, um, there's some things that just treat me, you know, treat me like I didn't watch the other films and, uh, that drove me crazy. But there's a history behind there, okay? George Lucas was kind of pushed up against the wall to make them, and that's one of the reasons he directed them, because he really didn't want to make them. And so he kind of went out on a limb to make them the way he made them. So did he make them yucky because he really didn't like the fact that he was being pushed? You know, it didn't collate with his stories at all, and it the timing is really bad on those movies. Um, if you want to get into that with me at some point, we can. But, uh, but that's, yeah, there's so, so many. <laughs> um, who else was on stage uh, at the Academy screening? I see three people in your photo. I cannot name the guy in the middle, but he was the interviewer. Yeah, he was the interviewer. And he actually had worked with them also. He mentioned that he had worked with them as well. So he was in effects, but uh, he's part of the Academy group. So he wasn't affiliated with Star Wars, but he was. Well, actually, he worked on Empire Strikes Back because Richard Edland hired him to do a little bit on Empire Strikes Back in the model area. But I did not, I've, I apologize, I did not catch his name. But if you look at that show, his name is, is in there. Um, but I did not catch his name. I was a little bit too excited about the other two guys, I have to say. Forgive me. Lucasfilm is reportedly planning a series about Boba Fett's Jewish grandmother titled Boba... <laughs> You, you're, 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 you're on, you're in your cups today, Joe. That was pretty good. That was pretty good. I, you had me at hello on that one. <laughs> the writer for Clone Wars, Dave Filoni. Yes. Uh, and, and when those two men came in, Dave Filoni and, 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 you know, these two, you know, they're making magic because you, you've all told me you love Mandalorian as well. 
I did too. And a lot of people felt like Mandalorian when, you know, that, that Disney probably saw Boba Fett was not really what they expected. And so they decided to do that seventh episode while filming that brings the Mandalorian in. My husband says he figures it was all planned because you got to you got to get up pretty early in the morning to do the series. But the point is, is that, that I think they knew whether they had lightning in a bottle or not, and the lightning wasn't igniting. So, uh, uh, Dave, you know, I, I don't know why you don't, I mean, these men can't do everything, but there are other people like them out there. Okay. Lots of people like them out there that do, that did a lot of beautiful books and things that were our tether between the first three films, four, five, and six, and then one, two, and three were made. Not well, but they were made. And we got to see something on the big screen. But in that, in between that was a big gap. And so many people like myself were completely blown away by the Star Wars uh, movies. And we went on to write books. We went on to do like Dave, uh, Clone Wars, like, uh, you know, all of us did different things. Me went into the film industry and sculpted sets and created costumes and did performances. All of this opened up to me because I saw it all in the nut of Star Wars and knew that uh, where my direction was going to go. So they all went off. Some wrote scripts, some did costumes, some did. And you just need to look at the writers that are in that block. I read a lot of them. I have several other books here. Uh, you just need to, to take one and make it. Because they did what we like. A Star Wars what? Universe. Yeah, absolutely. Star Wars universe. Um, <laughs> Greedo shot first. Nope. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Wrong. He didn't. He didn't. And I can do that whole dialogue. But he didn't. Yeah. Yeah, Han Solo uh, has his legs, he crosses his legs, he unsnaps the lock on his blaster, he quietly pulls it out, they argue, and he fires first. Yeah, it's been a debate like this with me and Joe for a long time, but I can tell you, yeah, yeah. See the first film, you'll see, he fired first. I know that may hurt your feelings, because so many love Han Solo, me too, but we can love the people that are bad, they're called villains. And luckily with Han Solo, he kind of has a second thought, but he's a lot of fun. You know, he's not all smitten with the princess in Star Wars, A New Hope. He would rather her die than himself. He's not going to risk himself. He wants his money. He wants to run, you know? So yeah, yeah. And there's a there's a transition and it's, it's fun when he, you know, it's it's fun, you know? Right down to, in the original Star Wars, the original 70 millimeter print, if you see it on the big screen, and this is one of the joys for me, and you look on the out the edge of the, of the frame. So let me just pretend that this is the frame right here. If you watch this edge as you look at the people getting their medals, these people are cardboard. Do you remember when people could have their images in the stadium seats during COVID? They could be cardboard. Well, these people right here are cardboard as they move into the rest of the people and look at the people who are about to get their medal. Yeah. Another debate was why didn't the Wookiee get a medal? And, you know, that's been a debate that's like for real. Monster Blues is cool. Yes, it is. And it's this weekend. It starts tonight officially. Um, um, officially at 6 p.m. this evening, goes till 10, and then tomorrow I think it opens at like 10 again. Yeah, so you, so try and get there. It's through Sunday. I think you guys will have a good time if you can go. Oh, Maverick! Keep your eyes open. Yes, uh, Maverick was a perfect time for me to see films with not a lot of people in the other films. I took full advantage. As everyone packed the theaters to see the long-awaited Maverick, Top Gun, which I hear is quite, <coughs> excuse me, fun ride. Uh, rather than go see that, I went and saw, I saw Everything Everywhere, which had uh, six people in the theater. And then I saw Downton Abbey, which had four, because all y'all were in Maverick. Whoop, whoop. So it used to be, before the pandemic, 
every theater was packed. It was not a time to go see films. But now with the pandemic, forgive me, people are figuring out other things to do. And this lovely get your seat first, reserve it online first is really lovely. Because you can look at the theater and see how many people are in it before you pull the trigger and go see it. And for if you're with someone who's high risk or you're trying to protect yourself from COVID-19 and just be careful indoors, uh, this is a great way to do it, is to find a time in a theater that's nearly empty. And uh, it was wonderful. The two girls that that sat in front of us, and we always do the recliners. This is another tip for you. There's usually a wall between each set of reclining seats because you can imagine if you if you push the button and you recline out like this, you might be able to look up. You know, you might be able to violate the privacy of the person behind you because you're flat looking up. You know, I think you get what I'm saying. And so they put walls there so that that doesn't happen. A couple of things are really great about that. If someone really wants to look at their phone instead of the movie, it does not disturb you. Yay, number one. Number two, um, it, they make the aisles bigger so that people can pass. So they are your distance, you know, five, six feet from you as they walk and they're up and you're down. So that's another yay. And finally, the seats are wider. So uh, you can position yourself in such a way that you can pepper yourself through the theater and uh, be without a mask if you so choose, but or with if you so choose. But the point is, is that the theater is practically empty. So it's like a private screening. So consider that if you're patient and you can wait to see a film. Um, I might like to see Maverick, but I really wanted to see Downton Abbey and four people was great. And these two women were just like us. They were very excited to see a new era and they sat a couple of rows in front of us and we reacted as though we were in our living rooms together. It was great. It was great. Only four, four. That was it. Uh, in everything, everywhere, like I said, there was probably about a dozen people, half a dozen people, a bit of a small theater. So we had to be a little bit more careful, but it wasn't that bad. So. So the nice thing about it is you can go online, you can look at the theater seats, you can pick your theater and say, hey, this looks safe and uh, and it's cool. And uh, the lounge chairs just give you that much different distance. I don't think they planned it when they originally put the lounge chairs in, but it's great now. Okay, just just some food for thought if you're someone who is a little concerned about the pandemic and you don't want to put yourself at risk, this is a great way to do it. Fantastic. Uh, So print, so the print didn't have the episode for a new hope subtitle subtitle. It just said episode four. Yeah. It had the, you know, as it crawls. Yeah. Yeah. I'm telling you it was the original. Yep. Very cool. Jamie Lee Curtis was the only saving grace for me. Too weird for me. Yeah. Too weird for me. Uh, My saving grace was Michelle because I'm a big fan of hers from the Jackie Chan movies. Um, but yeah, yeah. Uh, even Jamie Lee Curtis was a bit weird for me. Uh, I I wasn't quite sure. <sighs> Trust me, if you guys want to have a conversation about this movie, um, we can set a day. <laughs> so those of you that don't want to, don't have to. We'll say spoilers and we can really get into it if you want. But uh, yeah, yeah. Not my cup of tea either, Leo. Just, just didn't do it for me. I'm glad I saw it because it creates conversation. Any movie that creates conversation isn't all bad, you know, but wow. (laughs) George Lucas didn't do the special edition until 1997 and 1985. The foil would have been the same as 1981 re-release. I seem to remember the re-release had the alterations. I'll have to see what my copy is because I have it in Laserdisc and in... Um, DVD and both of those are doctored and they're early. Yeah, they're early. They're really early, Joe. So uh, he went in and doctored them fairly early. I don't know if it's labeled or accounted for, but let me tell you something. People who write articles can be incorrect and wrong. Um, I used to get, I got a book of all the Star Wars mistakes and I circled all the mistakes in the Star Wars mistake book and sent it back to the author. Okay, that's what happens when you watch a movie a lot. Yeah, and it's your it's your badge, okay? Just think if you're someone who loves Mickey Mouse. 
and someone starts to take liberties with that character that you don't appreciate. That's exactly what I'm talking about. So just put in your favorite character here and they do something, you know, that's what I'm saying. That's why I watch Miyazaki films with subtitles because the dubbing sometimes changes the gender of the characters and that's not theirs to do. You don't change male to female, female to male, different boy. No, no, that's unacceptable. Do not change the film. It's not yours to change unless you are the creator of said film. Okay. <clears throat> Makes me crazy. Mark Silverman, remember when Spielberg added those terrible CGI shots in E.T. in the new version? CGI E.T. moved nothing like the puppet. E.T. was a terrible idea. Yes, Mark, I do. And the thing that's wonderful about it is you can go back to the E.T. and watch the original version the way you saw it. That's my point. You can go, oh, it's back. Oh, it's so good. You know? Because that's the way we saw it. And that's what you got to understand is we don't need everything to be, have a makeover. All right. We want to see it the way we saw it and we loved it. However clunky and however, you know, yeah. I mean like seven samurai, I've told you about the black and white seven samurai. Okay. I love that film. If somebody went in and tried to fix it, their idea, I would just be so offended. It isn't funny because it's so wonderful. And the man is at the mercy of a camera. You can't make the camera spin. He can't do weird stuff. He has to do it with his actors and his camera mobility. Big cameras, guys. So, uh, yeah, this is one of the reasons I like black and white films because they've got some restrictions and uh, they work within those confines very, very well. And it's very, very impressive. So uh, I love that stuff. I love that stuff. Um, Harry Potter. That's one thing I got to say about Harry Potter. They mix, they blend CG with practical. And if you ever get to go to London to see their practical sets, you will start crying. They are so exquisite. Uh, my tour, uh, my guide just wondered why I wasn't going to the place where they do the audio animatronic puppets. And since that's what I perform and that's what I do, not that I didn't want to see it. It's just that I love the practical stuff. The Serpent Gate is unbelievable, and they actually let, let you work it. And I was like, oh, this is amazing. You know, Dumbledore's, uh, uh, what would that be? His room, his lair, whatever, has so many beautiful teeny tiny details that you cannot step out of it in less than 20 minutes. And most of the time I could take an hour in that room alone. It is so beautifully done and everything practical. The artisans, it's the art. So if you get to go to London and see those, please do it. And and I, my husband bought me a set that shows behind the scenes of Harry Potter. And the first one I put in, I thought the candles in Harry Potter were all computer generated. They were not. The candles in, in um, Harry Potter uh, in the Great Hall, some of them, were CG to show volume, but most of them were actual candles being lit. They had several fire marshals. They talk about it. Just incredible. I had no idea. I thought they were all CG and they, they, they used, it's just incredible how they did it. So you love to hear how they made practical work at a time when many people are going to CG, you know, and like John Dykstra said, John Dykstra says two things CG doesn't do. First of all, they don't do dirty. Well, they cannot make a dirty, damaged ship. They just don't do it right. It doesn't look right. It looks weird. It looks dumb. And uh, so a lot of people are like, go back to practical effects with it. And then he said, the other thing is that you get no serendipity. You don't get little magical things happening because everything must go and be, go through the computer. And that takes away a lot of the, the moments that you can get that you aren't expecting. That was his feeling about it. Yeah, he called it the, just want you kids to get off my lawn. <laughs> Not a fan. I mean, there are some things that CG really works, okay? Um, Steve Neal is on Facebook. He is. And if you sign up for his newsletter, he'll send it to you. Steve Neal is very talented. He's a, a lovely guy. Um, but uh, but uh, he's practical. He does practical builds. And uh, honestly, that's what I like too. I don't get to do it, but I'm really impressed with the art there. 
And, uh, and there are some, like I said, there's places for CG. Let's take Iron Man, for example. Iron Man has a really good marriage between CG and practical. When she holds the helmet, it's actually the helmet built by Steve Johnson's team. And it's a helmet. It's not a green thing that a CG is on it. She actually can react to the helmet as Robert Downey Jr. is able to react with some leg plates, with some chest plates. Those were actually built by XFX, uh, Steve Johnson's shop, and he could then feel the character as things went on him. But when it came time to fly, CG kicked in, and that's when it really, really works. When the Ant-Man has to shrink, how lovely is it to use CG? Really is believable, or when he has to get big, right? Um, when the Iron Man has to fly and do his flying battles, fantastic. But when he lands and they pull this stuff out, this is all really great for the actor to feel embraced and begin to embrace the character that they're portraying. Very hard to do when you're in a green screen screw suit in a green screen world and you don't know what the world's going to look like, going to feel like. All you got is a few sketches if you're lucky. Very hard to, to really feel that inside your soul. And, and actors are, are physical beings. They, they need that physicality. They need to feel that. Peter Jackson knew it in, uh, in King Kong and actually put Rick Baker in an actual, uh, uh, what was it, Spitfire type plane? I could be wrong with the plane when they're shooting down King Kong. But they had the planes. The planes were practically built so that the people could sit inside and be pilots, not just a cockpit with green everywhere. You see what I mean? So an actor needs those, those, those tangible things. And so it's really great. I think a good movie is to marry the two together. CG where you can't and practical where you can. And then you're going to have this really great marriage of a really yummy film. That's what I think. So I'm not anti-CG. I just think CG is used, used way too much. And, that, and it's hard on the actors to be to be able to, to give you the performances they want because they're acting in a green suit in a green room. And it's like, bleh. I wouldn't want to do it. No. Yeah. You know, want to do the fun stock part, which is to, you know, be in that cockpit and stuff. That's why Maverick is cool because Maverick had a special system where the actual fighter pilot could fly the plane. And then they had a cockpit behind it that the actor could act like they're the fighter pilot. How cool is that? You know, I don't think I would have liked to do it still. It's not my cup of tea, but for all of you out there that love to fly, how fun would it would have been to be paid to be in a, one of those, those fast ships, if that's what you like. Yeah. Yeah. I have an unexpected day off on Tuesday. So I'm doing uh, a Downton Abbey and Top Gun double feature, says Evan. I really want to see Top Gun and IMAX. So I'll get it before Jurassic World comes out Friday. Well, hallelujah. How fun is that? Just be careful, Evan. Um, be sure you go. Tuesday at AMC is a special day if you happen to have, if you're a member of their Stubbs program. And so uh, those theaters fill up quite a bit because uh, it's $6 Tuesdays. So just be careful, okay? Watch out for yourself. We don't want you getting COVID. Uh, Leo says, or be your authentic self with the realization and knowledge of what you're putting at risk. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You've got, you just got to know the consequences of some of the things you say. Okay. Um, I once met Sidney Poitier, um, in Venice and his advice to all of us was, you know, you have an obligation as an actor to be your best self when you're out in public. You don't yell at people. You aren't mean to people. Now there's some situations like if they meet you, you know, you're at the urinal and someone wants your autograph. Okay. You can be a little like, do you mind? Let's wait till we're out there and I've washed my hands. Okay. Um, things like that. But cause some people just lose themselves and they don't realize, but if you're polite and this is what Sidney Portier said, you have to be your best self because fans can make you and fans can break you. So there you go. You know, be good to all the people that love you. Yep. 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 Evan Hunter, Downton Abbey, and Top Gun. Maverick is a, that, it, that is a weird double feature. No, no, no. I think it's great because Downton Abbey has the warmth and the cut, the warmth and the love and the, oh, they're just, they're just, they got heart. And Maverick, I understand, has heart too, just at a faster speed. So 
depending on what he's seeing first, he may have to see Maverick and come down and relax in the feather bed of what is Downton Abbey or comfortably work your way up to the craziness of Maverick, right? I think they work. I think they work. No different than Downton Abbey and everything everywhere, uh, just so you know. Uh, Joseph says, I'm joining late this morning. I just got home from Anaheim yesterday. Yay, good for you, Joseph. Had a great time at the Star Wars Celebration and Disneyland Resort. I also went on the one. Oh, did you? Did you have fun doing that? Yes. Next time you got to let me know so I can show you the Hollywood sign. Because a lot of people think you got to hike to it, but you don't. Um, the Star Wars comics also fill in a lot of the in-between storylines. And this is a very good point, Joe. Because why not ask these comic book illustrators and creators to help you with one of your movies? You really don't have to reinvent the wheel is what I'm saying. Are you getting that from me? You really don't have to reinvent the wheel. No, you don't. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can actually ask these people who love it, care about it, and have written some good stuff that people already like. And let them make a movie. I don't think they'd say no. I think they'd love that. Uh, Joe says, hey, I know... Han shot first. In fact, Han was the only one who shot. And it was so much cooler than what they have now. I was just goofing on you. I know you are. But you see how I just let it go. Yes. Uh, Greedo's name. You also call him Guido. Yeah. Greedo is, is Greedo. And I don't know where I came up with Guido except for that. I don't know. I don't know. But Greedo, my husband's correcting it too. I don't know how I keep saying that because I know it's Greedo. But uh, for some reason, Guido comes out. I don't even know why. Um, it's just like saying Baby Yoda and Grogu. Little Gogurt. Um, it's not Baby Yoda. But a lot of people say Baby Yoda because it's a selling point. Okay? Because not everybody watches Mandalorian. And so when you say Grogu, people go, no, it's Baby Yoda. So a lot of times Disney will call it Baby Yoda. Call him Baby Yoda because it's easier. So I don't know where Guido came from. But you just correct me all you want. Because I know that, that that that's a challenge for me. Okay, if the crawl on the 70 meter had episode four and A New Hope, then it could not have been 1977 print because that wasn't added until 1981 theatrical release. A 1985 cinema print would have had the 1981 alterations, but not the 1997 changes. Correct. But it was a, an original 1977 print. Yep. And I won't argue with that. <laughs> The only one in existence. The only one. Can you imagine the only one left? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It was great. I watched Obi-Wan at SWC at Star Wars. Was that the Star Wars Celebration? Also saw the trailers for Andor and Ahsoka, but the best was seeing Grogu live with the cast. I'll bet. Yes, I did see. You know, the nice thing about Star Wars Celebration was that they streamed a lot of that. So I went in and peeked. I don't really have time to do the whole bit, but I went in and peeked and I thought that was cool too. A smart idea. I mean, I built a Yoda, so why don't they build a, build a Grogu? Of course. I loved having Yoda on my shoulder. It worked very well for my cosplaying. Indeed, it did. I have to find him. He's packed safely. He was made out of uh, soft foam, so it's probably pretty crunchy by now. But uh, uh, I could still show show you him if I find him. But yeah, my uh, my puppet. Uh... Do I have a Star Wars one? I don't know if I have one called Star Wars. I really should, since I'm talking about it so much. I really should have one. It's probably under presentations. Or maybe favorites. Let's look at favorites really quick. Uh, yeah, here you go. So I sculpted this one with a pair of Fisker scissors. So there it is. I'll hide this. You can see my face talking to you. Oops, my face talking to you. Um, boom. Okay, so there I am. I built the suit. I built the hat. Uh, there's an insignia on the top. I called myself a new hope. And uh, uh, I did the flute, I did the face, I did the eyes, I did everything, hand painted everything, cane, everything in the puppet and took best of show at two conventions. And uh, it was amazing, but I loved having a Yoda puppet so I can see why you like that too. Yes, indeed. 
Um, I can see what you did, Joseph. Uh, hashtag nerd, nerd arguments. Yeah, I won't be visiting that anytime soon. Um, I'm more than a fan of practical filming than CG. You can do anything with CG, but true filmmaking is with practical real sets, props, and lighting. I love stop motion animation as well. Yeah, and even stop motion animation is getting a little different, isn't it? Um, but we still love the stuff that has the real puppets. And if you get to the Academy Museum, I was, I thought Kubo was pretty good at the beginning, but at the end, my husband always says the third act kind of falls flat on a lot of films. And I agree with Kubo, but my gosh, if you get to go to the Academy and theater and see the actual stop motion puppet, it is exquisite. And I absolutely almost cried. It was so beautiful. Also in the costume department, I got to see a Strider and a Skeksis from Dark Crystal, the original Dark Crystal. And uh, as though, although I knew Jim, those two pieces were out of London. And so to get to see them in person was just breathtaking. So I agree with you. Practical, there's just nothing better than practical. Yeah, practical is very, very cool. Uh, I'll be seeing Maverick Tuesday at AMC, says Joseph, as well. I still continue wearing my mask as much as possible. Yeah, just know that if you go to an AMC Tuesday, it's a special. It's $6 Tuesdays, and that means more people, more, 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 more people. You can also get percent off throughout the week, but that means that the ticket might be $11 instead of 6 But $6 Tuesdays is a great time to see it. Excuse me, if you can go... I'd not be crowded by a bunch of people, which, you know, because I'm eating popcorn, which of course certain people say is not there, but I bring my own. One of my nephews met William Shatner in the men's room. He waited to say hello until Captain Kirk washed his hands. There you go, Joe. That's a good person. And was he pleasant to him? I hope. I hope he was nice. Uh, yogurt and baby yogurt, AK Grogurt. Exactly. That's why I keep calling him baby yogurt. So you'll see, you'll have to correct me. Little baby yogurt. <laughs> but he is definitely, whenever he shows up, we love the the, the episode, don't we? So uh, it's a pleasure to see him. It's a pleasure to see uh, uh, baby Yoda, which it is not Grogu, which it is, uh, do his thing. And we love watching it, don't we? Yeah, and it's great that there's a practical one. Um, I think I sent you Grogu video on message. If I didn't, I can try responding. No, 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 resending it. No, you did. And I saw it and it was great. And then also many of you sent me to let me know that uh, Star Wars Celebration streamed. And that was great because uh, I really got to see some of the, the panels like the one you're talking about, Joseph, and I absolutely enjoyed those. I didn't watch the whole thing. I kind of just sampled it, but I liked it. I thought it was really fun. I'm sure you guys had a great time. I'm real excited. I like that they stream it so that I could watch it from here while I worked. Or listen to it. So thank you for those of you who sent me those links. So because I don't know that I really knew that. Yeah. Uh, gonna hop off. I have some time before work. Been in a big TV binge and need to get back to my long list of movies. Gonna watch what we do in the shadows. Talk to you soon. Love you too, Evan. Have fun. And don't forget to cook. Uh, and have fun tonight. Uh, Evan is a personal assistant for the film. Uh, if you don't know what a PA is, that's someone who usually is the often treated like a minion minion. Um, and, uh, they don't get, you know, they're, uh, they're running, they're, they're, they're picking up cars, they're picking up clothing. They're, they're doing all of the stuff kind of like, um, run and grab it kind of times and not everybody is kind to them, but, uh, and then, and the pain isn't a lot of times really great, but what's cool is sometimes you're, you're put in connection with someone that you care about and someone that you admire. And Evan has been very fortunate. He's been connected with several people that he's actually gotten the opportunity to talk to. And tonight it's Julie Andrews. So tonight Julie Andrews is getting a special award and he hopes that he might be assigned to maybe get her a coffee or get her something uh, that she needs. 
and get to just say hello and tell him, tell her how much he admires her. So there that he's very excited about tonight. Uh, I would love to learn to sculpt in foam, says Michelle. Is there anywhere I could go and learn that? I need a class intent. Yes, I can teach you a class. Uh, I can show you about sculpting in foam. Um, one of the things about foam, maybe I'll do a thing on the tribe. Let's talk about that, Michelle. On Terry's tribe, I'll show you the different foams and the pros and cons of using each, okay? M right off the top of my head, using the green foam. And the green foam that you stick flowers into as a reservoir, okay? So you know what I'm talking about, the green foam. A lot of times when you're doing rose floats, um, big, big, big things, People like the green foam because it comes in a block that is two feet by four feet by eight feet. Okay. But the problem with it is, is your tools that you use many often it's uh, many uh, often it's a tool like this. Okay. Which we use for pumpkin sculpting and, and, and clay as well. Uh, when you scrape it, it creates just the right friction that creates static electricity and this foam adheres to you. Which is why when you work in the green foam, you have to wear suits and face coverings and pretty much entomb yourself. The problem with this is when you spray yourself off, it kind of goes away and then sticks on you again. Not so bad if you're the foam sculptor, but really bad if you're someone who knows a foam sculptor and it flies off of them and gets in your eye. It's like glass. It just hurts like the dickens. How do we get past that? We get past that by um by using what they call gold foam while disney when they carve their models and you've seen my model of um you've seen my model of uh let me just pop into uh let me see if i can find it i can't believe it's it's in, it's not in favorites really it's not in favorites what's the matter with you people stop stop come on oh i just did something cancel thank you good lord um let me just put in presentations, presentations, presentations. There we go. Uh, not there. So let's go to the next one. Um, not there. Let's go to the next one. Where is it? There it is. Okay, there we go. Okay, so this is the gold foam. This is what Disney uses, okay? And uh, I'll hide your comment for a minute, Michelle. This is gold foam. Gold foam, you notice I'm not wearing any protective clothing. And neither is uh, my partner here. And uh, the reason is because the gold foam doesn't, the tool does not create static electricity. Why? Green foam is two pounds pressure per square inch, meaning softer. Then you go to four pounds pressure per square inch, which is the gold foam. Now you can go even heavier. And I did when I sculpted Michael Jackson's weapons for Moonwalker. That was white foam, six pounds per square inch in order to create it, per square inch, in order to create it, okay? Uh, six pounds per square inch uh, in order to create that foam is often used in surfboards. Keeps them buoyant. So each one of these foams has its properties that work, Green foam is the least expensive, which is a reason people like it, but it causes a lot of problems. If you're in a shop or a studio, it will coat everything, which is why most of the time when I'm sculpting these pieces, uh, if it was green, I had to be outside like the rose float. When I did the rose float, everybody did it outside because it would statically attach to everything. And it was just this side of a nightmare. So um, that's why... And then it, it it works because gold foam can be very expensive. It comes one foot wide by four foot long by eight foot. Okay. A lot like the obelisk maybe from 2001. And the, so people love the bigger size, less money, blah, blah, blah. Like in the case of here, the uh, rose float that was built, this head is nine feet by nine feet by nine feet. It's like a nine foot square. So it would have been three times the money to build it out of gold. So we did it out of green. So we were outside. We had to be careful. So you get an idea of what I'm talking about. There's also a new foam that's pretty nice. You can get it at craft stores, uh, but it comes small. It doesn't come in the big giant section. So that might be something that I recommend you, you check out because it's more tabletop and does not adhere to you. 
I hope that that quick and dirty comment works for you. But I would love to show you. Yes, I'm doing tutorials. I'm working on those now. Tonight is movie screening at the cemetery. Julie Anders starts Monday. Ah, good. Okay, Evan, I thought you left. <laughs> but Monday, there you go. I don't know. I guess the movie screening you can't talk about because it's not out yet. Is that correct? There's a lot of things called NDA, meaning non-disclosure agreement, which is one of the reasons when people want to come to my studio, I have several NDAs in here. So I can't really have people come in because there's stuff I can't show you. Hey, everyone. Hope all is well. Hello, Andrew. And here we are. We made it just over an hour and a half. So guys, I just want to reach out to you and say, I hope you have a really wonderful time. Twilight. Oh my gosh, Twilight. <laughs> ah, another movie I don't get. Uh, but anyway, um, I know it's YA and people love it, but uh, it's one that, yeah, didn't, didn't, yeah, yeah, no. But how fun for you. Uh, that's great. And at the cemetery, I think that's really cool. Uh, I hope people dress up as vampires. That could be really nice, you know. Um, really, really interesting. Um, but yeah, so guys, I gotta say, thank you. Thank you for joining me today. I know that a lot of you are out and about as the pandemic, uh, LA is threatening. We may have to have uh, mandatory mask mandates as the COVID is climbing. So we may have to have a mandatory mask mandate for indoors again. And, um, oh goody, is this roller coaster still going to keep going and keep going and keep going? But patience, patience, and please don't take unnecessary risks, okay, guys? Be safe, be careful, because there's a lot of people that I've seen uh, interviewed who got COVID who say they're still having trouble with uh, breathing after years of having it, a couple of years having it, or months having it. There are some things that are affecting them that they weren't prepared for, so please don't treat it like it could be a common cold. We want to try and stay as far away from it as possible so be careful, be safe. And if you're going to be in a theater, check those seats because make sure you are in the middle away from people if possible. Okay. IMAX can be more expensive, but if you're seeing it on a Tuesday, it isn't. So you want to be careful. Okay. Just be careful. Try to find a screening where there's less people and protect yourself. Okay. Diane says, have a wonderful weekend, everybody. I agree. Have a good one. Look at you all sending your sparkly vampires is a great idea. And LLAP, thank you. I I love you guys. Hugs and kisses. I'm going to go watch um, Obi-Wan and then I'll let you know. But uh, I'm excited to see it. I, I, I really have great hope for it. So, um, you know. And I know a lot of you really, really like it. I, I just think it's got it's got potential. And so I'm excited to see it. Uh, I just don't want it to fail in the third act, as my husband always worries about. Uh, love listening while I'm working. Catherine, I love that you tune in. I want to thank you guys for everything that you do. Okay. And Joe also says, everybody stay safe. Hugs and kisses. Uh, I will tell you, I'm working on some things to show you and some things to share. But a uh, little bit, little bit, little bit. I thought you'd like to see those pictures. Um, do join the tribe. I'll be able to show some pictures I cannot show publico because of I, I don't know if it would infringe on intellectual property. So if it's there's a gate you got to go through, a lot of times those pictures are okay. So you have to be a part of Patreon to see some of that stuff, okay? And uh, big hugs, kisses. Those of you who uh, want to be in this industry, want to do some of this stuff, you've told me about your dreams and goals. Just make it, guys. Just do it, okay? A lot of people in the tribe, that's what they do. They just do it. And uh, if you want that encouragement, I, you know, what could be easier for $5 a month, right? So uh, save one Starbucks because it's not $5 a week. It's $5 a month, which means skip one Starbucks, make your own coffee, and uh, you can join, okay? I love you. Hugs and loves. Much of uh, uh, things, and um, I will talk to you soon. Do something nice for someone, it'll help you feel a whole lot better. Bye for now. Mwah.